refer to it so I can explain these definitions because they're subtle differences, but these are key when you're discussing with this community the issues at hand, or else they take it uh, very insulting if you don't use the terms properly. As I mentioned uh, in earlier conversations, there are categories within categories, and some of those categories don't accept the other categories, and so there's, there's tension for, for being identified properly, for having your particular sect of this uh, sexual spectrum respected equally as the others. So if we want to have a conversation and get to truth, we need to be able to speak using their terms and, uh, and fairly dispassionately so we can hear truth, and we want them to hear truth. So the, I know you've heard about the letters LGBTQ, and there's, there's other ones. Actually, in some places now, it's LGBTQIAPDK, and I'll tell you what those are. But le L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transgendered, Q is either queer or questioning. And it doesn't mean queer like it did in the 60s and 70s. It, it, it means a perplexing uncertainty. Uh, that's why they say it's questioning now. So when someone says, I'm queer, it doesn't mean what it did in the 60s and 70s, or maybe even 80s. It means I'm questioning that. That's what queer means now. Then there's intersexed, which would be um, uh, both sexual organs. Asexual, which ah means non, so non-sexed. Uh, polygamous, polyamorous, pansexual, or polysexual. Those are all the P's in that LGBTQIAP. It's poly, polygamous, polyamorous, means you love many different types. Pansexual, all the sexes, because in some cultures there's five different genders. A pansexual loves all. Polysexual. They're sort of all very similar. D is demisexual or semisexual. And a demisexual or semisexual is somebody who's either asexual or non-sexual, but they have romantic feelings. So they fall in love, but not necessarily sexually. So that's an, another category. And then there's the K, which means kink. And K refers to bondage and, uh, bondage and sadomasochism, dominant, submission, or any unusual fetishes. And the w I put the word unusual in there because they don't use the word unusual because there is nothing unusual. If you say anything is abnormal, you've already um, slanted and, and biased the whole conversation. You and I would say, well, normal means statistically what's most common, but that's not a term they, they would like to use. But fetishes, which could be anything. And there are certainly some bizarre ones out there. So that's what that name means. And, and some articles and some presentations, there's 25 letters in that acronym. It's so that everybody is included. And every time they think they got it down to everybody, another group says, well, what about us? And they put them in there. So it just it keeps going. So in most conversations, LBGTQ sort of covers it, but when you're really talking to them, each representative of a group wants to be acknowledged. So we have four basic issues, gender identity, gender expression, biological sex, and sexual orientation. And they, those might sound like they're all talking about the same thing, and in some way they are, but when they break it down for their analysis and understanding, these distinctions are very important, so I want to make sure you understand them. Gender identity is how you think of yourself or how you interpret your hormonal information. And the, new, the term that's popular maybe the last five years is gender fluid. So your gender identity doesn't stay in one place. It, it moves around. So one day you identify as a woman, one day you identify as a man, and one day you're queer or questioning. And so you move back and forth. That's, that's sort of the accepted very open-minded, very chic, uh, elitist way to approach sexuality now is to say, I'm gender fluid. Like, I have no labels. That, that's the popular one. But the spectrum is woman, gender queer, and man. That's the spectrum in that category of gender identity. And that's all up here. That's how you think of yourself in, in this um, world of understanding. Not necessarily the way you and I would interpret it but in theirs. Gender expression 
as how you demonstrate your gender. How you think might not come across in your expression because you might withhold or restrain your expression. So your gender expression is how you demonstrate it in your clothing, your behavior, or your interaction. And that's why oftentimes when you see people of a, of a variant from, from uh, what, we would be, what we consider to be the biblical norm, a variant sexual expression, it tends to be highly exaggerated. It's because a lot of it is acting out. They're trying to demonstrate their sexuality in terms of what they think in their head through their expression. And so in that realm, in that spectrum, you have feminine expressions and masculine uh, expressions, and then androgynous is in the middle. And androgynous means shared. So it's like an effeminate male or a masculine female. The androgynous means you can't really tell by the way they're dressed or the way they're wearing their hair or the way they're wearing makeup, uh, the way they carry themselves. You can't tell which one they are because they seem to be masculine but feminine too. That's the androgynous. And in some circles, that is the aim. Uh, if you can hit that perfectly, that's when you are, are in the best spot. But that's the spectrum for gender expression, how you demonstrate it. Uh, years ago, I, I came across my first, uh, what would have been called a, um, a transsexual back in the uh, 80s when I was pastoring in Dunedin, Florida. It was a, he was a tall uh, black fellow, about 6'6". Six, six. Uh, he wore a dress. He wore a dress every day, and, and he was in the, on the streets of Dunedin. I often bounced into him, bounced into him, ran into him when I walked in to get printing done for the church, and I talked with him a number of times. He would always wear bright, like maroon with pink highlights and always looked very feminine dressed, but he made no attempt to look feminine in his... It was male hair, male face, walk like a guy, pretty well built, but he liked to dress in female clothing. And uh, now today, he may have taken that further, but back in the 80s, there was still some uh, confusion over that. So he wasn't androgynous. He was a masculine-looking female, but you knew he was male by looking at him, but his gender expression was, was female. The third category is biological sex. They often call that the assigned sex, and that is the objective determination of one's gender due to genitals, organs, or chromosomes. And now that you would think that's obvious, male and female, but in the middle there's this category called intersex. And intersex are those that used to be called hermaphrodites, uh, who have both sex organs. Sometimes one of the sex organs is visible and the other one is internal, but their body is carrying both sex organs. So when I was going through my counseling uh, degree at Liberty, uh, that wasn't a real well-known uh, entity. And we were talking about biological sex, male or female, and is it the environment or is it genetic? What makes somebody homosexual or not? And there were some pretty blatant comments about what's well, as clear as day. You're either born a male or a female. And uh, I came across this category of hermaphrodites. And I did some research on it, so I, I brought it up in the, in the class. I said, well, what about those people? If, if they have both sex organs, really, what are they? And back then in the 70s, the answer was the parents decided usually at birth. And so the parents would make the determination and maybe inform their child later on that you were born with both sex organs and we made this selection of which one you would be. But nowadays they don't decide. They let the child decide later on. So in terms of being Christians, gospel uh, preachers and, and Bible believers, we at least have to have compassion on those who are literally born with both sex organs because a sex organ also carries the hormonal and estrogen and testosterone levels that, that m make you identified as a male or a female, they have to be confused. And it would be, I think it would be unkind for us to just tell them, and imagine you're born with both, but you're, you're dominant in one, but your parents, cho your parents chose the other. You were born with both sex organs, and you're predominantly male, but there was female organs inside, and your parents chose to remove the male and let you be a female. So you have a little bit of the chemical mixture of the female in you, but it, you were really predominantly male, and your parents made the choice for you, and this identity is in you somehow. And we often forget that for us as, um, 
everyday people. Sex identification is much more than just physiological. A lot of it is up here um, in terms of the way we view ourselves. Well, viewing ourselves is not just a philosophical stimulated truth. A lot of it is chemical. That's why testosterone or estrogen can affect your mood. That's why alcohol affects your mood. That's why medicines affect your mood. Your thoughts are affected by chemicals and electricity and things firing through your body, and that's all biological. So we at least have to leave an openness for that. So if you leave an openness for intersexed people who are legitimately born that way, then that grace, how far does it go out? That's the debate, I think, for the church. But that's biological sex. For most everybody, it's pretty objective, but not the intersexed people. They usually have to make a, a choice. Then you have sexual orientation. This is your sexual, spiritual, emotional, or romantic attractions. So that's what you're attracted to. That's what they mean when they say orientation. So your gender identity is how you think about yourself. Your expression is how you present yourself to the world. Your biological sex is what your physiological makeup tells you you are. And then your orientation is how you feel. And that's where people often confuse being gender fluid with uh, sexual orientation because they're attracted to both. Or they were attracted to males for 30 years. Now all of a sudden they're 45 years old and they're attracted only to females. And so they get confused as to, is that my orientation? Is that uh, my biological assignment? Or is that my, uh, my gender identity? It gets very, very confusing. And uh, to us, those of us who are, are, are fairly on the poles, we know we're male or female, and our, our biological uh, identity matches our mental identity and our attraction, it matches. It's hard for us to understand people who live in a state of confusion. But I've counseled enough people who've been sexually abused as children and know even when they have no problem with identity and uh, their orientation and their biological sex, they often have a problem with their behavior. And their behavior acts out what happened to them when they were a young child. And so if we want to minister to these people, we have to um, understand there's more at play than just what were the organs you were born with. So then we have the Bible. Now we're not going to probably get to all the biblical scriptures tonight. That'll probably be next week because this is just way too much to cover in one night. The Bible is pretty clear about a certain aspect of LGBTQ issues and Christianity. And it focuses on behavior. It doesn't focus on orientation. It doesn't focus on your expression or even necessarily your identity, how you think. The biblical instructions are about behavior, which leads us to some very profound questions. Uh, I think they're profound for us to ponder. Uh, number one on your sheet, I don't know what order yours are, but I'll just throw some out, you, out at you. Is there a distinction between orientation and conduct? Can you feel orientated in one way, yet not act on it, and still be genuine? There are many believers who are, they believe, for whatever reason, orientated towards the same sex, yet because of their faith and their desire to not um, pursue that, they marry somebody of the opposite sex, and they have children, and they try to have a family, but they struggle with it. But their orientation is contrary to biblical morality, but their behavior is not. So to that kind of person, and I would assume there's some in our church, as small as our church is, there are some in our church who would struggle with that. And I can tell you how, uh, well, how you and I can understand it. Have any of you here ever struggled with maintaining your physical sexual attraction to only your spouse? Has that ever, even for one moment, ever drifted outside in your mind? Well, that's a struggle with heterosexuality. It's a sexual struggle. Sexual struggles are common to human beings. Now, they break into categories, but if you've ever had to struggle with remaining faithful in your marriage, you can at least have some compassion on somebody who's struggling with this orientation that's pulling them away, but they're not doing it, but the tug, so they're having to fight the tug, we should at least um, uh, be aware of that and even 
a- admire that struggle. Um, so is there, is there a distinction? I think there is a distinction. And I think you can feel one way and not act on it. And I think that's honorable. Um, the uh, uh, condemnation in Scripture is not about the way you think about sex. It's what you do about it. What you do about it comes from your thoughts. That's why the admonitions are to control your thoughts and watch what you meditate on. But the Bible never condemns somebody who has an orientation towards the opposite sex, on the same sex. It's towards those who pursue it and do something about it. The same way it does about committing adultery. It's don't do it because the assumption is a human being, we're going to struggle with any kind of confines. So I think we should be sensitive to that. Number two, is there a a difference between thoughts and conduct or meditations? A momentary thought that comes in, is that the same thing as a continual thought, meditation? Or are they two different things? Can one be avoided and one not? Uh, Can a temptation come to your mind without you preempting it with a bunch of thought? And then can one come because you thought about it for a long time and fantasized about it? Those two things together? Those are distinctions of, of inappropriate sexual thoughts and how you react to them. Is, is there a difference in that? Most everybody I know and most all the pastors I know will, will freely admit momentary thoughts are inescapable. Momentary temptations, they, they, they come. It's the meditations that the Bible would talk to you about what you meditate on because what you meditate on tends to guide your behavior. You, you don't need to condemn yourself or get a whip with glass on it and beat yourself across the back trying to drive out sexual thoughts that might come in, but respond to it with proper meditation on biblical morality so those stay at bay. Uh, and uh, not, not to be humorous at all, because it's not, it's, it's uh, revolting, but our species in the holy word of God, God had to say to us, don't have sex with animals. Now, for most of us here, why would you even put that in a holy, sacred book of godly living? Because that's how depraved we are as a species. And and we are not elevated humans. We're just humans who happen to have been redeemed and then indwelt by the Holy Spirit and given the Word of God. So we we have some kind of blinders on. We have some kind of objective. We have some kind of sense of responsibility that can drive us. But you and I are no different than those people who we would consider to be sexually deviant. We're in the same, we have the same capacities, but ours can be checked and garnered and controlled and managed um, by godly living and godly thinking. And at the same time, some of these behaviors, uh, because I, I've watched this progression happen in people that I've counseled, who at one point in time in the conversation, they would never in their life do this thing. Let's say, for the sake of a conversation, I would never drink bottled water. Well, they start getting water in a glass out of the big glass tube uh, thing in the water cooler in the office. So they're drinking water out of the glass tube. They do that for a while, nothing harm comes. And then one day they're really thirsty and somebody offers them a bottle of water and then they take that first drink of a bottle of water and it wasn't that bad. And then six months down the line, they're buying bottles of water. Uh, We incrementally move towards changing our framework. And and, and when it comes to sexual misconduct, it almost never stays right there it will continue to slide because of the law of diminishing returns. And it takes more and more to get the same satisfaction. So I counseled a a young man a few years ago who believed in the Lord, believed in the Word of God, believed in um, heterosexual monogamy. A series of horrible things happened in his life, and it spun him off into finding things to fulfill his life until it led into a homosexual behavior and then homosexual violent behavior something he never would have even thought of five years earlier. But the quest to get satisfied, the quest to kill the pain, kept driving him for something new because everything he tried he thought would didn't satisfy it, so then he tried the next one. And after a while, he lost his perspective of how God looked at any of it. 
uh, one of my favorite verses on human sexuality, although it has nothing to do with it, is in Proverbs where it says, the, the full soul loathes the honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. So when you're full, um, even something really good and sweet, you don't need it. And it would be like Thanksgiving. After you've eaten your dinner, you've had your pumpkin pie, you've eaten all the whipped cream you can, the cranberry sauce, the turkey, the dry, and you're just stuffed. You've loosened your belt two notches, and somebody says, oh, we've got a strawberry cream pie. You want a piece? You don't have any problem at all. No, I'm full. Don't need it. But if you hadn't eaten all day, or maybe even all week, you've been starving, and somebody says, we've got this graham cracker, it's stale, but I can throw some peanut butter on it. You want it? Yes! Even, even something that doesn't taste good would be sweet to you. That's, that's the sexual draw. Because the gratification is so immediate, yet it never lasts. It's immediate. It gives you a sensation, but it leaves you hungering for more. And you keep going for it because your soul is hungry. You're, you're being deprived of something. It may be emotional, it might be spiritual, it might be physical, but stress and duress and loss can empty you out where all of a sudden you're looking for something to taste sweet and things that you know are bitter will taste sweet to you. Try going without sugar for a while uh, and then take your first taste of something with sugar in it and it tastes very, very sweet because you've gotten off that uh, diet. When, you, when you're talking about sexual proclivities. It's a, it's a very dangerous thing when it comes to what we allow ourselves to do. Uh, of course, and doing always comes from thoughts eventually, but do we hold heterosexuals and homosexuals to the same standard? So let's say we have here in our church and we have somebody who has a homo, uh, heterosexual lapse in virtue, makes a mistake. We extend grace we forgive them, and we try to restore them and mentor them through it. But what if they have a homosexual lapse? Our response is probably different. As a matter of fact, you might be able to have a homosexual lapse one time, and boom, you're out of the church. You could have 20 heterosexual lapses, and we'll still work with you. Now, it's because in our mindset, homosexuality is so much worse than improper heterosexuality, but in reality, they're both right in the same camp. It's not keeping confined to biblical morality. But that's hard for us to grasp sometimes. So I think when we minister to people, the homosexual will tell you the church is uncaring, ungracious, unloving, unaccepting to me because of who I am, even if I never do anything about it. So if a, if a Somebody who's homosexual is in, our, is in our fellowship and they're walking around and for some reason you've identified them as homosexual by their behavior, their speech pattern or whatever or who they tend to talk to. Uh, that tends to bother us. But if a heterosexual comes in who's not married but they certainly are trying to score with everybody, you know, it bothers us but it doesn't freak us out. We just wish they'd control themselves. But not a homosexual. It, it, it is a, there's a different reaction to it. That's okay. That's okay. Ushers, please get this man and get him out of here. No. There they are now. So um, I just, I'm asking these questions just so we, we, will, we will pause to think, how are we truly coming across? Are we coming across with the love of Christ to people who don't agree with us? Because I can tell you most of America would not agree with the stance that Faith Baptist Church has on sexual morality. So... That's our, that's our field of ministry. How do we reach out to them when our very position makes us a hater and a bigot? Uh, we, we have to be sensitive to that, not necessarily change our position, but we have to be sensitive to the message we're sending in subtle ways. Um, should we allow someone struggling with homosexuality to have access to the same sanctification processes of church life that people struggling with other sins have access to? And don't raise your hand, but how many of you know a practicing homosexual? Probably most of us at least know at least one. I've known hundreds, at least dozens. I, I, I've lost count. I didn't mark them up on a notch, but I, it's common in my life to know them. Very nice people. Easy to talk to, friendly, normal, love America, 
Some of them love church. They think they love the God of the Bible. Very nice. I don't feel threatened by them. They, they have the same conversation, the same interests that you and I would. Um, we have to, I think we should keep that in mind, that the church is for everybody um, with, with wisdom, and we have to be wise. Because then you have to say, what about pedophiles? Are we going to let them walk around and work in our children's ministry? You know, there, there's wisdom, and then there's, there's judgment of spiritual delineation of who that, what that person is. Or there's wisdom of they have a proclivity that puts other people at risk. And we have to make sure that it comes across clearly. And surprisingly, you know, and, and uh, in the 26 years I've been here, the church never being more than, you know, a thousand people in regular attendance, we have had many, many pedophiles in this church. And once it's exposed, they, they leave. Sometimes straight to jail, sometimes straight to court, sometimes into straight into counseling, but they don't hang around. Um, but there's, there's been a shocking number of them. And not because it's preached from any pulpit in here that it's okay, it's, it's human beings. And if that's in the church, I'm sure all the other things are in the church as well, especially in our culture. A question, to what degree can someone be struggling with sexual purity and be a true believer in Jesus Christ? Can you really believe in Jesus and struggle with sexual purity? I think the answer is obviously yes, but to what degree? And what does struggle mean? Does struggle mean giving in every night? Or does struggle mean once or twice a year or two or three times a year or once a decade? What is struggling <laughs> and what is failing and what is resisting? Um, to what degree can someone be struggling with sexual deviance and be a true believer? That's, a, that's an interesting question. We would say, well, if, if someone's heterosexual and, yet, and, they're, and they're sexually attracted to the opposite sex, well, that's normal. And yeah, you can, believe, you can believe in Jesus and be fighting that. Well, then what if it's a deviant sexual attraction? Can they still be a true believer? Uh, what does the Bible say? And what does the Bible instruct believers to, to be and do? If you think when, when, the, when the church took root in ancient Greece and Rome, which was a highly sexed culture, much more so than our current culture. I mean, public statues that would make Americans blush everywhere. Paintings on the walls and statues and, and temples where it was a, a culture-honored thing to go into the temple and pay a prostitute and have sex with the God while you're having an ecstatic utterance while you're having sex. That was considered the height of spirituality. Well, the church was winning people to Christ out of that group. You have to assume some of that came in, which is why we have the book of Corinthians. That's what Paul's addressing. Guys, it's okay that you came to know Christ, but you've got to cut these things out. You've got to stop them. And you can't always stop the heart, but you can stop the actions. And that seems to be the biblical emphasis, is curtail the actions until your heart is transformed. Hopefully the heart can be transformed first, but that's not always the case. Back in the early 70s when people got saved, it was often a very popular testimony about I was taking drugs, I did marijuana, and I forgot what the drugs were back in the 70s. I guess heroin. I don't know if cocaine was big back then. But, and I was a drug addict, and I got saved, and God took it from me overnight. I never did drugs again. And everybody jumps to their feet and claps and applauds. But then there's a whole bunch more Christians who were saved, remained drunkards for maybe a, a couple of years, did drugs off and on for a couple of years, so they finally broke free of that bond. It took longer. Well, which one's the more spiritual? I don't think either one of them is more spiritual. God just worked differently in their, in their lives. But how long can that struggle last until that person's not really a believer? That, that, that's the question in 1 John about if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been saved, you will not sin, or you will not practice sin. What constitutes practicing sin or just making a mistake? Committing a sin. How many times? You know, if you listen to uh, uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, uh, you ever, have you ever told a lie? Then you're a liar! All right. Well, then everybody here is a liar. You know, there, there's some grace, there's some degree of how many times makes you that, but um, 
But technically, no. Technically, it's true. If you shot somebody one time and murdered them, you are a murderer. That's Technically, that's true. But it wouldn't necessarily be the biblical approach to humanity and our struggle with spirituality. Uh, when it comes to sexual sins among our members, should we be proactive in identifying the misconduct? I mean, should we be investigating? Should we be interrogating? Should we be policing? Should we be researching each other's private lives so that we can nip it in the bud? Or so we can head it off at the pass? Is that part of the assignment of the church? Is that more a, an aspect of, of discipleship, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and getting invested in each other's lives? But what is the church's role there if this issue is really that important? Can, and this is the question I think is uh, the profound one for the church, can people be born with a homosexual orientation? I'm pretty sure I was born with a heterosexual orientation. I don't remember it, but I've never struggled with it. None of you guys have ever been attractive to me. I was born a heterosexual. So if I can be born a heterosexual, is it theoretically possible you could be born a homosexual? If, if your sexuality is determined by genetics and biological determinators and something's off, is it not possible? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I know the answer to me is, the answer is, yes, it's possible. Uh, and I have to hold that out because I don't know all the answers to human biology, physiology, genetics, and all these other issues. But if I'm going to witness to people, I have to assume there's mutations of all kinds. There's deformities of all kinds. Can there not be, I can't, and I can't use this word in this kind of discussion, deformities and mutations when it comes to sex. Because in our culture, that is not, none of those things are mutations or deformities or abnormalities. They're just different shades of the beautiful spectrum of sex. But biblically speaking, there's God-ordained sex, God-designed sexuality, then there's outside of that. And we are Bible believers. So we have to hold the biblical standard in a culture that completely rejects it and, and, will, and will laugh at us. And you can't win. I, don't know if I didn't watch the Oscars because I can't, I just can't. But I read some of the articles afterwards. Some famous actor said something about uh, the four best directors and, and, name, and named the woman by name. And she did it to you know, be a feminist and bring up the point that women aren't getting acknowledged for their great work in film. So she said something like, the four males and Greta Gray Wood or whatever her name was. And, you know, there was applause, and applause but on, in social media, everybody was upset because one of the males was black and one was Hispanic. So she just sort of dissed and shaded two minorities. So in, in the ultimate public expression of I'm attacking what the white male world, she made enemies by insulting a black and an Hispanic because she was trying to be pro-woman. Because that's the danger of political correctness. You, you can't win. When it comes to sexual um, terms, it's getting to be the same way. You, you almost can't discuss it without offending somebody somewhere. That doesn't mean we shouldn't discuss it, but we have to be aware of that. Uh, I'm going to stop in a minute and let you guys make your comments. Is the purpose of the church to shape and preserve a culture or to preach the gospel? Or is it to do both? What are we here to do? Are we here to make America great again, or are we here to preach the gospel to a rotting America? And if we weren't in America, what would our purpose be? To preach the gospel in an Islamic culture? Preach the gospel in a pagan culture? Preach the gospel in a secularized culture, an atheistic culture? Would our mission there be to save the culture, change it, or just shine light into darkness? I think it often is affected by where you live, what you think the role of the church is. But it's always primary to, to preach the gospel. We just have the, we have the accepted role in our culture up to this point to affect it. They've let us affect them. Some of the national uh, founding documents and principles were rooted in our faith. Well, that's got thrown out. So 
it's not going to be long until the people who believe what's got thrown out, until they're thrown out, that, that's coming. And one of, the, one of the tips of the spear is this issue. Will the church of Jesus Christ accept lesbian, gay, bisexuals, transgendered, questioning, intersex, asexual, polygamous, polyamorous, pansexual, polysexual, demisexual, semisexual, and kinks? Are we going to let them come in? That's going to be a determining factor if we will even first be allowed to have taxes and status. And then maybe someday if you're allowed to even conduct a service. Or if you're allowed to speak online. If you can have a Christian television show. You know, maybe some here from Canada. For years in Canada, the, uh, the television broadcast, Christian broadcast, have been prohibited from speaking out on certain sexual issues. You can't even do it. Well, that's just one, that's just on our north border. And that's, that's, that's already been discussed in our country as well. So, um, one more question, then, then I'll stop. Does God require the church to react to sexual sin in the same manner he required the nation of Israel to react? And you would say, yes, sir, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is the Father of lights in whom there's no variable, there's no shadow of turning. So it's got to be yes, unless you understand that the nation of Israel and the church are two very different things. <laughs> one is a theocracy and a governmental state, and one is a living organism, the body of Christ. One has the power of the sword and one does not. Um, that changes the way we interpret, because the nation of Israel executed people in all these categories. Always for conduct, though. Not for orientation or thinking, for conduct. They executed them. So if God said to the nation of Israel, yes, execute them for reasons that he knew were vital and important to the life of the country, he didn't give those instructions to the church. He didn't tell us to execute anybody. And all the executions, in, even in American history, that were driven from supposed scriptural interpretation was taking the mantle of government and putting it on the church. That's why, one of the reasons why America was founded, to get the governmental arm off the church so the church wouldn't impose its beliefs on people who don't have that particular belief, and we call it religious freedom. The freedom to express your religion in the way that you want. That wasn't true until the founding of our country. There were national religions, even in the Christian world. And Christian groups persecuted all the other Christian groups who didn't ascribe to their particular beliefs. And by um, persecuting, I mean to the point of death. Christians torturing other Christians because either they were Calvinist or not Calvinist. They were Catholic or not ca Catholic. They were Anabaptist or not Anabaptist. They didn't ascribe to a particular belief system, and they, they then were against the very cause of Christ. And the church had the power of the sword and would kill. Which is, I think, why we never, that's why we have separation of church and state. It's the authority. We don't, we don't want that because we don't tend to manage it uh, very well. And the New Testament doesn't give it to us. It tells us to preach the truth and stand strong because until modern history, uh, believers never had governmental influence. We, we never had that power, and rightfully so. So those are the questions I wanted us to, to, to at least ponder tonight. Next week, we're going to focus on the numerous scriptures about sexual behavior that are in the Word of God to give us a, a biblical presentation of it. But I wanted us to think about our particular um, stance and our attitude and our compassion towards people who are struggling. Now, I guess you'd have to counsel somebody and see them in tears that they, they would love to stop or they feel so totally rejected and hated because of their struggle to realize that this, this, is, a, this is a human issue. It's not just a, a theoretical category. They, these are real, true human beings who are struggling with this stuff. And some of them you may never know because they, they can't possibly tell you because they know they'd get rejected. So they keep it within and they fight and they fight and they fight their whole life with it. Uh, we have to have compassion. All right, anybody have any comments or, or questions 
about anything that we've introduced uh, in tonight's um, discussion so far? Anything you'd like to say or, or ask or have clarified or, or have confused further? I can do that. Yes, Joe? Deprogram them, yes, yeah. And in a, if you can hear what he was saying, this that in the 60s, the idea of somebody being born a homosexual from the Christian viewpoint was preposterous. Now many Christians do accept the idea that is a possibility, can be born that way. And the, the, the profound effect of that is that changes the way we interact with people. Because if somebody is born that way, uh, in, in reality, they, they, from their earliest memory, they, all they know is they were attracted to the opposite sex. Or they were asexual, have no sexual desire, which is, which is also common. That if they were born that way, their struggle is very different than somebody who decides at 15 because they hate their mom or their dad or they were at a party one night and got drunk and had an experience and it wasn't all that bad and they became one. That's a different whole drive and, and we have to deal with it from that perspective. But if we just throw it out, is that, that's not even possible. What does that say to somebody who, who they, they have no memories at all of ever being attracted to the opposite sex? If you just throw out the possibility that, no, it can't, can't possibly be. There's no way you were born that way. The discussion ends. You can't even, you can't bring him anywhere. <laughs> then it goes into deprogramming. Um, I think we have to, we have to extend some grace. I, I think our time has taught us that, that if you can, you know, well, a, a good example, genetic behavior. Uh, my, my daughter's not here, and I've said this before, but my daughter, until she was a young teenager, was never around my sister that much at all, because we always lived 2,000 miles apart. But, I could see my sister and my daughter every day. My sister, sister was one of my best friends growing up. I loved my sister, had a blast with my sister. I have a baby girl, and she looks and talks and acts like my sister. Well, that wasn't because my sister was around. She wasn't learning that behavior. It was genetically in her. In some way, she was exercising out what her genes were telling her. And because it's my sister, it's the same genes... So if that's possible, that genetics can, can give you your personality, isn't it possible it can give you some other things? I think we have to at least accept that. But then it all comes down to the same guideline. It's behavior. It, you know, that's, that's all you can really look at is behavior. And the Bible says don't do certain things so you don't do them. Um, and there's, and there's courage, and there's faith, and there's bravery in somebody who struggles and doesn't give in. That's, that's, there's, there's faith, there's beauty in that, that they resist that. And for some people, that's, that's really their, their, their struggle of faith their whole life because they're not ever going to preach or teach or, or build a church or do something profound. They're going to stand before God and answer to God for how did they face the challenge they were given. And theirs may have been this internal struggle. You know, one of the great theologians of Christianity, uh, Augustine. If you ever read his testimony, talk about a vile, vile sinner who participated in every kind of sexual practice he could to the point that all the prostitutes in town knew him by name until he became a believer. Uh, and he, that was the, one, of the, one of the founders of deep Christian thought, came out of a very sinful background, and he talks about the struggle he had after becoming a believer. Now, he never did the behavior again, but the struggle echoed the words of Paul in Romans 7. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. There's a war raging within me. Uh, you know, we should, we, should, we should honor that, the struggle that people, and comfort them and encourage them and tell them to keep it up and strive to, to abide by biblical morality, even if your body's telling you something different.
like it is for all of us. Our bodies tell us, indulge in some stuff, but we don't. We confine it. Well, same thing as on those other things. Um, anybody else have a comment or a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. If you take sex out of the equation and just look at all the mandates of Scripture, uh, does God have the authority to make those mandates? And are they good? Are they wholesome? Are they right? Are they productive? Well, of course they are. And so we should obey. That's, that's the, the role of the believers to obey, not to be happy. But we want to be happy. So we, we fudge the rules, trying to find a way, way to, to be happy. But we're challenged and exhorted and rewarded for obedience. And obedience is rewarded because it's contrary to human nature. Uh, but that's where the that's where the faith is. That's where the that's where your strength is made by you have this desire but you you don't act on it. And I think there's a virtue and honor in that. Um, what, and again too remember the book the Bible is not that's not the primary issue of faith is sex. And sometimes we make that, that's what this is all about, is controlling sexuality. <laughs> that's not what the Bible is about. It's just that sexuality is so profoundly impacting to human identity. That's why it's important. So, the, to me, the worst thing in our culture is not heterosexuality or homosexuality or bisexuality or all the other ones. It's the casual nature of sexual interaction that we're teaching our young people, no, experiment. Play around, just have fun. It's just, it's just a biological function, just go have a good time. That's far more dangerous than these bigger issues we're arguing about while our culture is promoting to young people at the earliest age, flaunt your sexuality, exercise it, indulge it, so by the time they're 15 years old, their, their very core being of their sexual identity is so all over the map and their well-being, their self-esteem is so blown apart by rejection and betrayal and connection and ripping apart and that they've, they're destroyed as a human. Well, we're arguing about gay or not. It's the casual nature that, that sex can be participated in without any true emotional, spiritual connection. To me, that's much more dangerous 
because it, it's creating uh, inhumane behavior uh, among civilized people in, in a Christian culture. Well, it's uh, 7.25, so we should probably stop there. Uh, think about any thoughts you might have you want to bring up next week. We're going to get into what the Bible actually says about some of these things um, next week as we continue this conversation and then try to resolve it with, then what should our position be on certain issues? Of uh, If a gay couple who said they believe in Jesus and they've been saved and they love each other and they're never with anybody else and they want to get married, should the church let them get married in the church facility in a biblical ceremony? I know what your answer would be, but you know we, we should, well, let's wait till we hear all the information so we can respond with a, a well-founded, uh, non-rejecting response. Because um, truth is often offensive and rejecting in and of itself. We don't have to add our little two cents to it to make it more powerful. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have the opportunity to sit in freedom and, and have this discussion, or at least hear these thoughts and ponder them before we make our comments. And I pray you help each one of us to, to be open-minded to truth, but also to have the parameters of Scripture guide our conclusions. And even if our conclusions are contrary to our culture, that we might hold those conclusions with compassion and kindness and love. Uh, many of us, before we were saved, live lifestyles very uh, opposite of uh, biblical morality. And, and you saved us. And somebody came and gave us the gospel, even when our lifestyles demonstrated we had no interest. May we keep that in mind as we deal with our culture that is so distant from what we believe. May we look at them with compassion and realize they, they've been blinded and we're supposed to be light. Uh, may you bless each person who came tonight and may you use us to be a force for good, salt, and light in our culture. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming. If you didn't get a handout, the handouts from last week and this week are down here in the front. Uh, if you have any comments that you didn't want to say publicly but you want to email them to me, feel free. I won't use your name, but they can help guide some comments next week as we follow up on, on this. God bless you. Thanks for coming out.